If you turn to your neighbor, um, think back 12 years ago. The year is 2010, okay? Turn to your neighbor just for 20 seconds. Where were you 12 years ago and what were you doing? Go. 2010, what were you doing and where were you? For those of you at home, write it in the chat. Where were you <laughs> 10 years ago, 12 years ago? You can't remember. 12, 2010. Uh huh. <laughs> It's your birthday. Was it your birthday 12 years ago? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Happy birthday, man. <laughs> All right. Okay. How many of you would say, a lot has changed in my life in the last 12 years? Right? Come on. I'm going to show you a picture here on the screen of me and my family 12 years ago. Look at us so Thin <laughs> and young. And this is our daughter, who, by the way, is also her birthday today. She's 14 today. Yes. And it's also Diego's birthday. Yay. Awesome. So uh, anyway, so 12 years ago, we were in Ireland, and we served in a church there. And Berlin wasn't even yet on our radar, and uh, we just... You know, Liam wasn't even born yet, and who would have thought that 12 years later, we would be together today, worshiping Jesus together, being part of this church together. Uh, who would have thought that our stories, uh, our paths would cross like this? I want to look with you today at a story in Mark chapter 5, where after 12 years, two very, very different people with very, very different stories, their paths cross because they both need Jesus. And that's how they come together, these two stories. Uh, we are in a series on the Gospel of Mark. We call this series All Eyes on Jesus. And if you have in your contact card, you have a little page um, uh, with, the, with the Bible text for today. If you have your Bibles on your phone or whatever, it's in Mark chapter 5. Uh, or you can just follow along here on the screen. I just want to read this. It's a longer text. I just want to read it and comment on it as we go through it. And then just briefly share three things for us uh, after that. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so Mark chapter 5, <clears throat> 20, verse 21 following, it says this. Jesus got into the boat again and went back to the other side of the lake, which is the lake Gennesareth, where a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. So if he went back to the other side of the lake, he went back, that means he's been there before. And people already knew about him because he was serving people there. He was doing miracles. He was teaching people. And he already had kind of a reputation there. And so when people heard, hey, Jesus is on his way back here, they got excited. And they wanted to see more miracles. And they wanted to hear more teaching. And that's why they all gathered uh, on the beach. And then it says a leader of the local synagogue whose name was Jairus. Everybody says Jairus. Some of you said it. Good. Then a leader of the local synagogue whose name was Jairus arrived. Now, this probably was a very prominent and respected leader in the community, probably very wealthy, very uh, influential. And it's interesting that he comes to Jesus because by that time, Jesus was already um, kicked out of some synagogues. Okay? They didn't like him. And also the religious leaders at the time, they have already started to plot on how they could kill Jesus because they didn't like him. So he is a religious leader who comes to Jesus. And when he saw Jesus, it says, uh, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him. My little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her, heal her so she can live. And this man, he was desperate. He was pleading with Jesus. And any of you in the room who are fathers, you can relate. There's no, I don't know of a worse feeling than when your old, own child is sick and suffering and there's nothing you can do. Especially, it's not just, oh, she has a runny nose or something. It seems like she was fighting for her life and he was helpless. And also, it seems like all the doctors, there was nothing they could do about it. She was dying 
And so um, that's why he uh, came to Jesus. In the Gospel of Luke, who also tells us this story, it says that he, she was, uh, this daughter was the only child that Jairus had. And so he runs to Jesus and he arrives on the shore, uh, as, as Jesus arrives on the shore. And it says then, when he said, come, my daughter needs healing, Jesus went with him and all the people followed, crowding around him. The word crowding here literally means pressing in or choking, okay? That's how tight this mob almost, that's how, like this whole entourage, as they were trying to follow this Jesus because they were like, oh, he's gonna do a miracle. Let's check it out. Let's see what happens next. And it, they were all really, like there was no social distancing, none, okay? They were really close together. This is important because there was a woman in the crowd who had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had, she had some kind of gynecological problem, which in that culture, because of their purity laws and everything that they had, uh, that made her unclean, which means she was excommunicated from the communi community. She was an outsider, an outcast because of her sickness, okay? Which means, She had nothing to do in that big crowd. She wasn't allowed to even touch somebody else. Like, what was she doing there? She wasn't allowed to be there because they were all so close together. She had suffered, it says, a great deal from many doctors. And over the years, she had spent everything she had to pay them. How much do you have left when you spent everything? Nothing. She was broke, okay? She had nothing left. Um, and also, she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse, it says. And then she had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. Um, for she thought to herself, if I can only touch his robe, I will be healed. Literally, it says here, she kept saying to herself, if I can only touch his robe, if I can only touch. Can you picture her going, trying to make her way through this you know, tight crowd? Like, if I can only touch his robe. I can only touch this rope. Maybe I can be healed. Like she also was desperate, right? And uh, when she touched his rope, immediately the bleeding stopped. And she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. However, Jesus realized at once that power had gone out from him. Now, some of you are triggered when you hear that power had gone out. Oh, no, a blackout, okay? It has nothing to do with electricity, okay? <laughs> It's a joke, guys. Okay, so healing power had gone out, okay? Healing power had gone out. Um, and so he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? And his disciples said to him, and I'm sure Jairus asked the same question, what a silly question, Lord. Look at the crowd pressing around you. How can you ask, who touched me? That's weird. Like, everybody's touched you. Why do you ask this question? But Jesus, he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her, now this is beautiful, he's not blaming her, but, uh, but he's uh, commending her. He's applauding her. He's saying, daughter, your faith has made you well. Now go in peace. Your suffering is over. It's beautiful that bit of the story. But imagine in all of this, imagine Jairus looking at his watch and just kind of, come on, come on, we may be too late. Like he was just worried about Jesus is coming with me, great, but what if we're too late? What if we're too late? And now he's like, Jesus, what are you doing talking to this lady? We don't have time for this. Jesus, I don't know if you've realized how critical the condition of my daughter is. We've really got to hurry up, okay? And so he was stressing out and he had nausea and all of that. And while Jesus was speaking to that woman, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue, and they told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use of troubling the teacher, meaning Jesus, there's no use of troubling him now. And that's got to have been the worst moment in Jairus' life when the people came and said, your daughter is dead. Nobody wants to hear that. Uh, imagine how he felt. Imagine especially how he felt in that moment towards Jesus. You know, this lady had a problem for 12 years. Surely she could have waited another half an hour. But no, you had to heal her. No, 
you had to talk to her and now my daughter is dead because you didn't hurry up, Jesus. Okay? But Jesus overheard the messengers and uh, he said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe. Then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and the brother of James, John. That was kind of his small group. <laughs> Imagine them now, uh, these, like Peter, James, John, um, and Jesus, and Jairus, these five guys walking down the streets on their way to Jairus' house. Uh, Jairus obviously beside himself. I just imagine them walking there. I, I imagine Jesus may have had his arm around his shoulder, around Jairus' shoulder, and just like, don't be afraid. Come on, just trust me. Believe, believe. You gotta believe. Don't give up. Let's go. I'm gonna show you what I'm capable of. Right? That must have been such a, such, such a tense moment. Um, when they came to the house um, of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw, um, saw much commotion and weeping and wailing, which is another indicator that Jairus was a wealthy man because he had already hired, or his wife had already hired, professional mourners, which was a thing at the culture at the time. When somebody died, you tried to uh, hire somebody who would mourn the death with you. And the, more, the louder they would weep, the more important the person who had passed away. Okay? And so there, there was a lot of noise, which means the daughter of Jairus had died, okay? And, uh, and so Jesus went inside and asked, why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead, she's only asleep. What? That's strange. Like Jesus gives us a very strange but new and refreshing perspective on physical death. He's saying it's only temporary, it's not to be feared. But the crowd laughed at him. Just a moment ago, they were, they were weeping, and now they're laughing. But it's not a funny, ha-ha kind of laugh, but it's a very cynical laugh. Like, ha, really, Jesus? Are you, are you joking? Like, what is this? Are you, are you kidding me? Um, but he made them all leave. He says, get out of here, get out of here. <laughs> it's funny. Get out of here. And um, he took the girl's father and mother, so she was also there, and then his three disciples, Peter, James, John, into the room where the girl was lying, dead, holding her hand. Remember, Jairus came in the beginning and he said, can you come and lay hands on my daughter so that she may be healed? And now he takes the hand of this uh, dead girl and um, again, so tender, so gracious, he said to her, Talitha koum, which means... In Aramaic, it's, it means translated, little girl, get up. Actually, little girl, I looked into this a little bit. Talitha, your daughter's name, Talitha, is actually, it's very hard to translate. It's a very, very personal, heartfelt um, word that a mother would use uh, for a daughter. Maybe the closest thing in our language would be honey or sweetie. And then also the get up is as if you would wake up your daughter in the morning because she's been sleeping in and it's time to go to church. <laughs> okay. So Talita Koum is, uh, sweetie, it's time to wake up. Isn't that, isn't that beautiful how tender Jesus was speaking? I, I just love it. I, and and uh, he raises her from the dead like a mother would wake up a child from sleep. And then the girl who was how many years? 12 years old. She was 12 years old. She immediately stood up and walked around. And the people there, they were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what, what had happened. And then he also told them, and I think this is just so wonderful how practical Jesus is. He told them to give her something to eat. This girl had been sick for a while, so maybe she hasn't eaten in days. And Jesus is saying, don't just stare at her. Come on, give her something to eat. She's back to life now, okay? Now, an amazing story, isn't it? An amazing story. And um, what I hope you can see here is that there are two people and Jesus does a miracle for both, but they could not be more opposite from each other. In fact, I, I just wrote it down here on the screen and I just want to share with you, some of those are super obvious, but just so we have an understanding of how different these two people are. So we have on the one side, we have Jairus and on the other side, we have the woman. Oh, it's in Frau. Oh, well, you know, it's some German. It's 
I didn't translate. Okay, so the Frau, the woman. Okay, so obviously Jairus is male and the woman is female. Uh, that's obvious. Okay, then another difference is that the, uh, Jairus had a family. Let's see, is it now? Oh, let's do this one first. So, so Jairus is named. One of the few people who actually were the recipient of a miracle who are named in the Bible. Oftentimes they're anonymous. There's Bartholomew, there's a few others. But uh, Jairus is named. He's known in the community. This woman is unknown. She's unnamed to us. Uh, Jairus has a family that is listed here. The woman probably has no family given. Uh, Jairus has friends and associates. He's very net well networked. The woman was alone. Um, Jairus was wealthy. The woman was bankrupt. Jairus had 12 years of joy behind him because he enjoyed the life of his daughter. The woman had 12 years of agony and pain. Um, Jairus was on the top of the social scale. The woman was at the bottom of the social ladder. Jairus was clean, he was a holy man. The woman was considered to be unclean. Jairus was the synagogue leader. The woman had been forbidden to attend worship because of her condition. They are so different to each other. At the same time, both of them so desperate. Both of them knew it, it, Jesus is our only hope. If Jesus doesn't do something now, It's not gonna like they, it's it's not gonna happen and 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 both of them took a risk in faith. They risked their reputation. Um, both of them knew something about the touch of Jesus. Hey, lay lay your hands. There's something about the healing hand and the woman. There's something about touching his garment. They, they knew something about the touch of Jesus. Both of them knelt down before Jesus. Jesus does a miracle for both of them. Both times. Jesus is being laughed at before the miracle happens. The disciples laughed at Jesus, like, why are you turning around to ask who touched you? And also the mourners laughed at Jesus when he said the girl is only sleeping. Both, time, both times Jesus is particularly gentle with his words, and both times Jesus does a miracle that exceeds the one they came for. Okay? Now, As I said, we're calling this series All Eyes on Jesus. We want to discover who Jesus is. And let me just give you three things that we, we can just put our eyes on. This is who Jesus is and what we can learn about Jesus from this text. The first one, if you want to write this down, is Jesus is ready to drop everything for a miracle. Jesus is ready to drop everything for a miracle. He arrives at the shore there, and just as he arrives, Cyrus already runs up to him and kneels in the dirt, which for a religious kind of um, prominent leader to kneel in the dirt was very much unexpected. And Jesus is moved when he saw the faith in Jairus. He, he's moved by, by the way, we can see this all over the Bible. It seems like there's one thing that we have that really impresses Jesus. And that's our faith in him. Sometimes he's also um, surprised by our lack of faith. We have some verses about that. But here he's clearly moved by this man's faith who would risk his reputation and his standing in the community to kneel on the ground and say, Jesus, help me. Jesus, help me. And maybe you want to write this down. Faith moves the heart of Jesus. Faith moves the heart of Jesus. Um, And Jesus here, he's clearly moved with compassion. He's moved that Jairus runs up to him. And Jesus honors bold faith because bold faith honors Jesus. See what I mean? Jesus honors bold faith because bold faith honors Jesus. And so he drops everything for a miracle. And they're rushing to Jairus' house. And all of a sudden, Jesus feels there's power that had gone out, for, out of him. And he stops everything. The entire entourage. Kind of like they were in the ambulance with the sirens on. Like it's an emergency. Come on, come on. We got to hurry. And then he says, stop. Right? And he's stopping this whole thing. And he turns around to try to find the person to show her his love. A mentor of mine once said to me, don't just study the steps of Jesus, also study the stops of Jesus. Who Jesus stopped for. And that's the next thing you can write down. This Number two, Jesus is willing to stop everything for a person. He's willing to drop everything for a miracle. He's willing to stop everything for a person. All of us know there are two different kinds of illnesses that you can have. You can, it's either a chronic illness or an acute 
um, like a crisis, kind of a critical illness. Chronic illness, some of you are struggling with this, you've suffered for years. It's extremely painful. It's, it's, it's annoying, and, and it's, it's, it, there's so much pain involved. Um, but you also know when you have to go to an emergency room with a chronic problem, you're going to be there a long time. Because the person with the chronic problem, even if he or she is in much pain, will always have to wait until the person with the critical condition receives some treatment. Especially if it's like, oh, there's a girl and she's fighting for her life. Everybody will have to wait because this is clearly a priority, right? And so what Jesus is doing here is like <laughs> he stops everything for a person with a chronic problem. There's a girl who's dying, but he's making the woman with a chronic problem a priority. That is irrational, guys. That's malpractice, isn't it? That's not how you're supposed to do things. And it's just really confusing. Have you ever been in a hurry and God wasn't? <laughs> That's frustrating, isn't it? That's how Jairus felt. Come on, my daughter is dying. We've got to hurry. And Jesus has all the time in the world to have a chat with this lady. And he gives her, like, she has zero status, zero influence, and he turns around and treats her as if she's the most important person in the world. And Jairus, the respected leader in the community, has to sit in the waiting room. Jesus did this all the time, by the way. It's just almost as if this was a game for him, that he tried to turn the values of this world upside down, just to make a point that the kingdom is different and that everybody's equal at the cross of Jesus, right? Like he says, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. <laughs> Things like that. He said, uh, blessed are the poor, not the rich. Humble yourself and you will be exalted. Same thing here. Like, Jairus, you wait. I'm going to talk to this lady right now. Now, this woman, I think she's also a very interesting character because we, we know that she had heard about Jesus Maybe she heard of his miracle power. Maybe she heard somebody say, hey, we think he might be the Messiah. Now, we need to know that the Jewish people at the time, they believed that when the Messiah would come, he would have so much healing power that you could only touch him and you would be healed, which is what happened in this story. You could only touch the Messiah, you would be healed. There's a prophecy about the Messiah, about Jesus in the Old Testament, in the book of Malachi, who was the Italian prophet, Malachi, okay? Malachi, <laughs> Malachi chapter, what is it, chapter four, uh, it says about Jesus, but for you who revere my name, for you who respect God, the son of righteousness, now it's calling about the son, but it's also calling about the son, okay? This is uh, about Jesus. The son of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, in his wings, and you will go free, leaping with joy like calves let out of, of pasture, um, let out to pasture. So the sun would come with healing in his wings. Like, you get the image. If I only touch his garment, like there's healing in his wings. And then also the healing would come and you would jump around. Have you ever seen a video of calves who are let out of the barn in the spring and they can go walk on grass again? It's hilarious. You should YouTube it, not now, but maybe later today. And they just jump around and they're so happy that they see grass again and they're no longer in the dark and all that. And the Bible says that's how healing will feel like. And this woman is thinking, okay, if he's the Messiah, maybe she knew of this verse, I don't know. She, she knew, if I want to touch him, maybe there's healing in his wings. I just want to touch him and then I'm going to run away and I'm going to be happy and I'm going to be free. But Jesus said, I'm, I don't want to just have a touch and run here. <laughs> No, no, he, he forced her to go public, right? She wanted a miracle, he wanted a meeting. She wanted a healing, he wanted her heart. He wanted to connect with her, he wanted to engage with her and, and reveal himself to her and have a conversation with her. Listen, don't just run to Jesus so he can fix your problems, run to Jesus so you can enjoy his presence. Mm. Yeah, I know some of us, that's sometimes all we come to Jesus for is like, oh, fix my problems. Here's my prayer request lists, right? Run to him to enjoy his presence, to connect with him. There's a Psalm, uh, verse in Psalm 107 where it says, The Lord sent out his word and healed them, and he delivered them from their destruction. 
So let them praise him for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done for them. What does that mean? When you've been healed, you have a reason to worship. Okay? Every miracle is a reason to worship, and worship always happens in his presence. Let me ask you, what is it that God has done in your life? What is it where he has shown grace and kindness to you, and you have never thanked him for it? You haven't yet praised him for it. God doesn't want to be a vending machine where you just come to him and like, here's my prayer, give me the miracle. No, he wants to connect with you and he's willing to stop everything to make it that personal for you. So Jesus is ready, Jesus is willing. Number three, Jesus is able to do immeasurably more than we ask. Jesus is able to do immeasurably more than we ask. Jairus, he asked for a miracle But Jesus did more. Jairus got a resurrection, which hasn't happened in 800 years. The last resurrection in the Bible was during the time of the prophet Elisha, okay? Do you think that shaped the faith of this man, Jairus? <laughs> Duh, of course. He was never the same again, right? This woman, she came looking for a miracle, but Jesus gave her more than that. He gave her a personal encounter and she was honored and valued and treated with respect like she hasn't been in 12 years or maybe for her entire life. Do you think that shaped her faith and her trust in Jesus? <laughs> of course it did. You know, sometimes I, I wonder about these people who had encounters with Jesus, especially if there's miracles involved and in I wonder how they think back to these moments years later, like Jairus. If in the months and years after this incident, if he looked back on this day, maybe with a smile on his face, thinking, oh my goodness, why did I rush him? <laughs> why was I so in a hurry? Like, I, I was a silly me, right? I, I had no idea what he would be capable of. Or this woman as well, like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I almost tried to rush away from him. He wanted to meet with me. He wanted to show me how valuable and how the dignity that I have. Like, I can't believe I was so silly that I tried to run away from him, right? In Ephesians 3, chapter, uh, chapter 3, verse 20, it says, Jesus is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. He is able to do, if, guys, that's got to change the way you pray about your stuff in your life, okay? Jesus is ready to drop everything to heal us, He's willing to stop everything to connect with us and he's able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. Now, just bear with me. This is important. These three things, these three statements, that is the gospel. The good news of what Jesus has done for us. For our rescue, Jesus dropped everything. He left the heavens behind to come to rescue us. He hurried to come to rescue us. The Bible says he did not cling to his glory, but he made himself nothing. And he came to our rescue because we too were dying in our sin. That's what he did for our rescue. He dropped everything. For our relationship with him, he stopped. He was willing to stop everything. Think about this, guys. On the cross... Jesus was willing for his heart to stop. He ended himself. That's how willing he was for our relationship to stop everything. He stopped himself. He ended himself. His heart beat stopped. The one who is everlasting breathed a last breath. But then... It didn't end there. He was willing and he's able to do immeasurably more than we could ever imagine. On the third day, amen? Come on. On the third day, he rose again and he is alive today. I believe this. I know many of you do this as well. Jesus is alive today and he, in his resurrection, he gives us the very same gift he gave to the 12-year-old girl, new life, a resurrection, Right? And the Bible says that in him we live and we move and we have our being. 
I want to pray for you right now. The band can already come up before we sing a few more songs. I want to pray with you and maybe you can bow your heads or close your eyes. And maybe as you listen to me um, talk about this, maybe you've been wondering, well, how can I know that these nice statements that they've put up on the screen, how can I know that they're also for me? How can I know that this offer, that Jesus would do such things, includes me? Maybe you're thinking, I'm just not sure if I have enough faith that my faith would also move Jesus. Let me tell you, it is not about the quantity of your faith, but about the object of your faith, who you have placed your faith into in Jesus. It's not about how much you believe, how much you trust, but who you trust in. And if in this story we've seen a, a woman who was frightened, who was terrified, who was excluded and broken, and yet her faith was commended by Jesus, applauded by Jesus. If that's true, then that can also be true for us. That it means you're welcome too. I'm welcome too. We can also come to him and trust him with our salvation, but also with the brokenness and the problems in our lives. So having said that, let's pray right now. Even if your faith isn't complete or you're not really sure, but let's pray to this Jesus, the object of our faith, trusting that these promises are true. Jesus, we thank you that you are willing to drop everything to come to our rescue. Thank you that you're willing to stop everything to build a relationship with us and that you are able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask. Lord, I pray that you would do that in our lives. I want to pray this in faith for my brothers and sisters in this room. Some of them have been praying for a particular miracle, maybe for a while, maybe for years. Maybe they've stopped praying for it because they've been disappointed that it hasn't happened yet. Lord, we can be so frustrated and annoyed and irritated and confused sometimes when your timing seems to be delayed. Help us to learn from this story that even when it seems too late, it's never too late for you. And uh, you can do even greater miracles than we ever asked for or imagined. Lord, I want to pray that you would come through for us. I want to pray that you would learn, uh, help us to, le to learn how to trust you and your perfect timing and your perfect ways. And I pray that you would surprise us with the way you're going to come through for us. And if there's anybody here today who's maybe never kind of stepped across the line to say, yes, I want to trust this Jesus. I want to place my trust in him. But I pray right now as we even sing these songs that you would meet with this person in a very real, tangible way that they can't walk out of here denying or confused about the fact whether Jesus is real, Lord. Come now as we sing these songs. Meet with us, all of us, Lord, and encourage our hearts. We pray in your name. Amen.